Support for Clever comes from Thomas Avenue Ceramics. Thomas Avenue Ceramics provides beautiful quality and cost-effective tiles at the click of a button. From simple porcelain floor tile to handcrafted herringbone glass mosaics, they've got everything you need for your next remodel. They've built their site from the ground up to provide the perfect digital aid shopping experience. Your first three samples are free. There's flat rate shipping on all orders with no minimum order quantity, and the helpful staff is available via live chat or over the phone to walk you through the process and even suggest design ideas. Go to thomasavenueceramics.com and use the promo code CLEVER to receive a 10% discount on your first order. It was like a year and a half of, yeah, just really intense rehab and lots of woodworking, lots of self-care. And I think, I think it was weird because for so long I had been a teacher and like kind of mentoring and caring for students. And then all of a sudden I had to like give a shit about myself. Hi everyone, I'm Jamie. I'm Amy and this is Clever. And today we're talking to Kate Duncan. Kate is an independent woodworker and furniture designer maker operating out of Vancouver, British Columbia. She was born and raised on Vancouver Island and found her calling when she fell in love with woodworking in a high school shop class. As a professional, she spent over a decade as a high school shop teacher herself. But then a fateful accident led her to heal herself through woodworking and a collection was born. Now she's running her own brand and has started a popular Vancouver design event called Assembly that celebrates the Vancouver maker scene. Plus, it gives her an excuse to throw a great party. So let's talk to Kate. My name is Kate Duncan. I live in Vancouver, BC, Canada, and I'm a furniture designer, maker, and I also produce an annual home and design event called Address. Why? Because I love it. I'm obsessed with furniture, should probably be medicated, <laughs> and I love throwing a good party. <laughs> nice. Yeah. <laughs> You're nice. my kind of lady. The, yeah, the party part's really important. <laughs> So let's like go back. I want you to lay the groundwork for us and tell us maybe like a story from your childhood, including like the colorful cast of characters that might give us a good sense of, of where you began your creative journey or how things started out for you. And what was your life like? I had a great childhood. I grew up in a small town on an island just off the coast of Vancouver. So it's a short ferry ride away. And my parents are rad. I have two incredible parents that I'm really, really grateful for, my mom and dad. My dad is this huge, softy sweetheart with just wears his heart on his sleeve. And my mom is like probably the smartest person I know. She's just absolutely brilliant. At around age five, my brother entered the cast. <laughs> <laughs> and he's he's awesome too they're all three of them are accountants so <laughs> that very uh -huh. very firmly positions me as the black sheep in the family <laughs> <laughs> which is an interesting position to be in even with rad parents and an awesome brother it's still really hard to be the black sheep so growing up was awesome but also had its challenges i think that um have have put me here today which i really appreciate in a way challenges challenges yeah i think i think being a being a bit of a black sheep can oh i'm getting so nervous guys no oh you're so cute there is no reason to be nervous this is all going to be edited my family's accountants too and i'm the black sheep so you're amongst friends oh okay. my god accountants what's with them <laughs> They're so linear. I don't even know. How oh, don't, so uh, pragmatic. <laughs> oh, I know. And they just were so frustrated by my creativity and my out there ideas and my spacey way of looking at the world. Like it just flustered them. Yeah. It befuddled them and made me feel like I was disapproved of, which was hard. Totally, you know, totally, totally. Both my parents are amazing people. 
but it's also really hard to relate to one another, I think, because they do things so linearly. They are so pragmatic. And my creativity is just, I think, sometimes seen as like a liability. Yes, totally. <laughs> it's so hard to be in this amazing family that also sees your assets as a liability. You know, I don't want to make them sound like this was, you know, that my childhood was terrible or anything. No, it, it's not terrible, but it is a, a conflict of sorts because I, I mean, I look at it now, I can see my parents just struggling to support me in the right ways, but just not knowing what to do or how to do it. Totally. Yeah. And they were almost like frustrated with themselves more than me. But of course, as a child, I didn't pick up on it that way. Totally. And, you know, I internalized it. I'm like, oh, my God, what am I doing wrong? How do I do this right so that you so that I'm not disappointing you? And I just internalized all these mixed signals that, you know, in adulthood, I've straightened out or made my best attempt to. But totally. Yeah. It wasn't a lack of love. It wasn't a lack of guidance. And it wasn't, you know, I had stability and I had food on the table and privilege, all these wonderful things. All of the wonderful things. Yes. Yeah. All of the wonderful things for sure. But at the same time, they definitely, they definitely didn't know how to encourage me in that way. Mm -hmm. I remember for my 10th birthday, I asked for a sewing machine. And I didn't, I didn't know how to sew. I just knew that I wanted to put <laughs> fabric together. <laughs> so I asked for a sewing machine. And of course, my parents being the amazing humans that they are, they got me a sewing machine. And so we opened the box on my birthday and me and my mom just kind of look at each other like, now what? <laughs> there was no thread. There was no fabric. <laughs> like we didn't know how to turn it on or even plug it in. <laughs> so the sewing machine present led to the next present, which was sewing lessons <laughs> that I took for ah. years. I took sewing lessons for years from this cute lady up the street. And so we figured it out. We figured it out. But it was yeah. it didn't come naturally, <laughs> to say the least. Yeah. <laughs> It was definitely an interesting childhood. When I was about 13, my mom wanted me to be more ladylike. <laughs> if you know me at all, it, ladylike is not a word you would probably <laughs> use to describe me. So she put me in charm school. <laughs> like, who does that? <laughs> so I had to go to charm school when I was like 13 years old, we learned how to like walk up and down stairs and get in and out of cars. We learned how to do our nails. Like I'm so not that girl, <laughs> but here I am in this like class of all these other girls that are just eating this shit up. And I'm like, you guys are whack. I'm doing every finger a different color and you're all going to have to be okay with that. <laughs> Uh, and then you go home and you feel like my mom's disappointed in me because I'm failing charm school. <laughs> totally. And I did fail charm school and she sent me back. <laughs> she made me do it twice. <laughs> oh, man. It was a time. It was a time. It was a time. <laughs> we survived. We all we all made it out alive. And, and we're all really close. Like we're, we're a really tight family. So. Definitely a lot of good there and a lot of love. I did learn how to walk up and down stairs like a lady. I can pull that out of my ass when I need to. <laughs> That's a fun trick. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's talk some more about adolescence because if you're in charm school and you're already self-described as not ladylike, <laughs> did that cause some conflict and some angst? Were you <laughs> trying to figure out how to like establish your identity in the world what did that look like and then like did the sewing lessons progress into something more full-blown yeah adolescence was also an interesting time it's it's hard to be other you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. I was really into music when I was in high school so I of course signed up for band class and I showed up at band class and looked around the room and and went and sat with my people which were the girls which were all holding like flutes and clarinets so i i picked up this little tiny flute with my giant man hands <laughs> and all these little ten little buttons and this tiny little mouthpiece and i started to play the flute and I, it lasted for like a few months i gave it a good a good try i really did i really tried and then one thing led to another and it was a slippery slope but the next thing i know i'm playing the tuba 
<laughs> There's this big toilet bowl mouthpiece that you just push up to your face and flap your lips into. It's got three big buttons. It's like this giant beast of an instrument. So I, I ended up playing the tuba and the trombone all through junior high and high school. I was in many, many woodworking classes. I was, I was like this major geek. <laughs> I took my first woodshop class in grade seven. Everybody had to. I'm so jealous. There was no woodshop for me. Mm-mm, me neither. Uh, I feel like I would have found my path so much sooner had I had the opportunity to take a woodshop class. Yeah. Yeah. I loved it. I was totally hooked. So that was, you know, a love affair kind of at first sight. So grade eight, grade nine, 10, 11, 12, I was a woodworking junkie. By the time I was in grade 11 and 12, my shop teacher was enrolling me in woodworking competitions. Like, yeah. So yeah, I did definitely, you know, big picture didn't really fit in. My tuba playing woodworking ways were like not <laughs> sort of normal. <laughs> <laughs> but again, I made it out alive. I did it in my own way. <laughs> So then like what happened after high school? Did you know kind of what you wanted to do? And did you end up going off to college to study? I don't know. I guess it, it would be some sort of woodworking or design or furniture building or what did you do? I think I thought I knew what I wanted to do. I thought I wanted to be a teacher. Mm. And so I went to university to become a shop teacher. I studied woodwork, metalwork, drafting and automotive at a post-secondary school. And then I, I, got transferred to another post-secondary school where I did my undergrad in education. And then I taught high school woodshop for like almost 10 years. What was that like? It was wild. It was a wild time. Lots and lots of boys. Uh huh. They are such an interesting group. This like, I was going to say high school boys are 15 year old boys <laughs> like and like 30 of them that's a fascinating case study it was it was really interesting i remember i kind of started to figure it out when i brought in this giant stereo system i mean the speakers were like five feet tall it was huge and we would blast acdc and like <laughs> just jam out and like hammer stuff and they they loved it. That's their language. You're speaking it. it. Yeah. <laughs> it took a while to kind of figure it out, but they loved it. And then partway through my teaching career, I want to say I got a bit bored. I think I was looking for a little bit more. So I went back to university to do my master's degree. And I wrote my master's thesis on gender inequity in trades training programs. And that was really interesting. I learned so much about myself that I didn't even know I didn't know. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It was so interesting. I interviewed a number of girls who were in like woodworking classes or automotive classes. I interviewed girls who I considered to be experts in being trades students. And I wanted to figure out what that reality was like for them. I mean, and I kind of thought I knew, like I had been a student in woodworking classes for many, many years. I had, you know, woodwork, metalwork, drafting, automotive, I'd taken all the classes, but it was really interesting to hear the perspectives of these young girls who were kind of kicking ass in like woodshop class. Each one of them had their own story about how they assimilated to this sort of hyper masculine culture that was in their classroom. And if they didn't assimilate, they didn't really get, they didn't really feel like they got the respect or even the information that they needed. No, you, you don't get the respect. You don't get the information and you get uh, sidelined in a way that means you're not getting what you need to out of the situation. Totally, totally. So it was so interesting to hear how each one found their way into this kind of world through assimilation. And I didn't even realize I had assimilated, but I totally did. Like I 
totally identify as like masculine of center. I wear big boots and, you know, swear like a trucker. And so, and they were all describing the same thing. It was like, oh my God, I'm not alone. <laughs> oh my God, this is so fun for me because it was exactly the same for me. You know, I learned how to drink like a fish and swear like a sailor and talk shop with the guys. I learned how to use leverage instead of brute force for things that I wasn't strong enough. I learned how to speak the jargon in a way that bypassed any sexual stereotypes, you know? Yeah, it's so interesting, hey? Yeah. yeah. And it's this big step, this big, it's actually really big, this thing that you have to commit to doing and then do it. Mm-hmm. Mm hmm. Yes. And it's such a barrier. It took a toll on my femininity, too. Totally, totally did. Yeah. One of the research findings was that realistically, only girls that were really willing to sacrifice their femininity were ones that succeeded in trades training programs and went on to have careers in the trades. Wow. Yeah. It was some like heavy shit that I didn't even really realize I was a part of. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. It was so interesting. It really blew my mind. Yeah. Ah, I love that you did the research on this because I know it as part of my personal experience and I, I sort of can assume or extrapolate about other females experience, but I, I really haven't chatted anybody up about it in depth. Yeah, I know. Right. And I think the common I think a really common sort of understanding or belief is that girls and women just don't aren't really interested. They don't really want to know those skills. And that's not it at all. Like, it's not it at all. No. And I found like all of these skills that I didn't know I had because they hadn't been sort of drawn out of me in my youth. But I have this inc incredible mechanical prowess and, and inept. I mean, inept. Yeah, I'm inept in a lot of ways. <laughs> <laughs> but this innate sense of spatial relationships and yeah. this nonlinear thought process that can synthesize disparate ideas in a way and then figure out the mechanical process to connect them. And that was so fun and so exciting for me. But then I also had to deal with this conflict, which was that everybody sort of assumed because I was interested in that, that I was also a tomboy and that like hunting and fishing and sports were things that were interesting to me. And oh, yeah, that's so not my jam. <laughs> no. <laughs> and I was like, I want to do my hair and wear lipstick and high heels and go to punk rock shows, you know, and totally. there is a little bit of connection between punk rock and woodworking. But yeah. Yeah. I had to connect my own dots back to femininity and it was it was yeah. a rocky road actually. Yeah, I know. Isn't it like almost all women that I've bumped up against in a male dominated kind of field has this same experience that is never really talked about. Like it's always labeled as something else. I find it really frustrating too and I think we talked uh about this with Drew in, in one of our recent episodes where like people don't know how to process like multifaceted human yeah. beings yeah. who have like all like disparate interests and like just end up trying to silo people into these like stereotypical, you know, like caricatures. <laughs> and it's so frustrating. <laughs> It's like I have a really interesting gender representation on top of that. So like some days I wake up and I feel really masculine of center. I put on my work boots and I, you know, thump my way to work and then I'll come home, have a shower, put on some pumps and a dress and go out for dinner. And both are real. Like just because and both are you, it, I can yeah. be masculine of center doesn't also mean I don't want to put on lipstick and high heels and walk up and down stairs like a lady. <laughs> Man, I hear you. Cause also that stuff's not practical while you're working. So no, not at all. <laughs> so in order to do what you love, there is a sort of uniform that makes the most sense. And it it's clothes that are easy to move in. It's shoes that protect your feet. It's um, pockets. <laughs> oh my God. All the pockets. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely no V-necks because acrylic and sawdust gets in your cleavage and that is the most uncomfortable. The worst. It's the, the worst. worst. <laughs> <laughs> and boob sweat just attracts everything. And then you can't wear lip gloss or anything because sawdust and acrylic dust and sticks to that. 
I hear you. The struggle is real. Real. So yeah. real. So real. <laughs> I'm taking off my bra and dumped it on the floor as I'm stumbling myself into a shower and it's like full of sawdust. <laughs> it gets everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember it used to feel so good sometimes to just take off the sweaty jeans and like, you know, shower away the masculinity and put my girl self back on. And I feel like that kind of switch between the two makes each space more like vibrant, more vivid or something more powerful. Yeah, the contrast does something, I think. Yeah. Like when I'm my girl self, I'm like my girl self. <laughs> right. And then it's like my curves are curvier and my <laughs> let's do the switch together. You want to like woodwork all day and yeah, get dressed up? <laughs> totally. That'd be so fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's, let's talk about your professional life because now you're like, you're fancy. You're an East <laughs> Vancouver based independent designer, maker, woodworker. And you've made a brand for yourself and you're doing your thing. I know. Isn't it wild? We want to know how it happened or how you made it happen. Like what were the first few steps into the professional world like when you decided to do this? It, I, it literally happened by accident. I was riding my motorcycle to work one day, like my teacher work. And I got sideswiped by a car in a hit and run. And then I, I fell off my bike. Like my bike flew out from underneath me and I was on the street you know, sliding down the street. And then a bus came up from behind me and like ran over my head and crumpled my bike. <laughs> oh my God. Literally by accident. I ended up having a couple of surgeries. I had my hip reconstructed and a metal plate put in my arm. And I was off work for like a year and a half rehabbing. And I got really bored really fast. I, I'm like one of those people that's always on the go. So... I found a wood shop in East Van that was like almost like a co-working space, but for woodworkers. And I like not into yoga and I really hated rehab in general, like physio. And I hated sort of tending to these wounds for like lack of a better word. I, I wanted to like make things. So like a year and a half of like healing your wounds through woodworking. This is intense. It was hard. But it was also really actually kind of amazing. It was like a year and a half of, yeah, just really intense rehab and lots of woodworking, lots of self-care. And I think, I think it was weird because for so long I had been a teacher and like kind of mentoring and caring for students. And then all of a sudden I had to like give a shit about myself. But also really kind of cool. Like I really found myself and I really figured out that I can make furniture and I'd never really seen myself as a woodworker in industry before. I'd only ever seen me as a woodworker in a classroom with a bunch of 15 year old boys. So I didn't really understand mm. that I knew what I was doing. Like I didn't understand that I really understood woodwork. And so when I started working out of this sort of shared woodworking space, I really came to realize that I, I knew what I was doing and I was actually pretty good at it. And so I kind of rehabbed myself by just making myself some furniture. And that sort of evolved into my first collection. Like it was so weird. I remember hiring a photographer and like rolling out the big white backdrop <laughs> and being like, is this real? Am I really doing this? I felt totally fake. I was like, oh my God, I'm an imposter. <laughs> but I, I did. I took some photos and I started like a social media account and like bing, bang, boom. I mean, when you get splattered on the pavement like you did, yeah, I'm sure a lot of things come into focus and a lot of the bullshit, you know, just flips away because it's unnecessary. I have always felt that making is therapeutic, but I can't really articulate why or how. Can you? Well, I think being physical and moving is just important. Like 
I think it's just something that people are built to do. And, and I really, I always admire people that are super sporty and athletic. It's like, God, I wish I could move my body in that way be sporty or coordinated. Oh my God, guys, I'm like so not coordinated. <laughs> <laughs> but woodworking is like same shit, different pile. It's still being able to skillfully move your body and make things, make it make things. I, I definitely found a lot of strength in that, in being physical and figuring it out again, like question mark. Like I had to kind of figure out how to use my body again in a way that worked with like my bum hip and my kind of wimpy wrist. And, you know, it was really cool. It was really therapeutic. You know, they'd say like, you you got the blues, go for a run, you know, like go get some exercise and you'll feel better like mentally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like that, I think. Well, it relieves stress too. So I think there's just something about like something in your brain starts firing like endorphins kick in or something like that or you know your your yeah. brain can stop focusing on the negative things and focus on the task at hand which releases the tension I guess in a sense totally yeah I was so sick of like going to physio and occupational therapy and all these different therapies where they'd like move your arm back and forth back and forth back and forth and i'd be like okay this is like really lame i'm gonna go do this in a wood shop and be productive and not really think about moving my arm back and forth but actually think about creating something and then actually create something beautiful Mm -hmm. and kind of like that first collection i kind of blew my own mind i was like god i didn't know i had this in me and all of a sudden there's this body of work that's like actually really cool and so you've got this first collection so then what happens obviously it was successful because you're still doing it i just kind of stumbled into the business like i said by accident so i literally had an accident i kind of accidentally made a collection i was just making furniture for myself i had no intention of launching a collection and then i kind of went okay this is cool i can do this i'm going to actually do this on purpose now So I took some time. I like let go of my teaching career and I designed a body of work that I thought could actually be manufactured and could actually sort of appeal to people, not just, you know, my own self and my own storage problems in my tiny one bedroom apartment, you know, like (laughs) no more drawers, enough with the drawers, Kate. (laughs) So... (laughs) Yeah. The second collection and the second kind of kick at the can, I think, is what really established the brand and what actually did is successful, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Well, so address wasn't an accident. So can you tell us about this event slash platform slash showroom thing that you've created? It's really awesome. Yeah, I love address. Address kind of feels like you know, if Kate Duncan brands kind of my main staple address brand kind of feels like Kate Duncan brands, little sister, like she's so cute and adorable and you just got to love her. She's kind of a pain in the ass, but you just kind of got to love her. It's address brand is I had a hard time connecting with clients. I didn't know where or how to show my work. And I remember kind of talking to somebody and I, I sort of said, look, I got, I got this beautiful collection of work. I know how to build the stuff. I I know woodworking like the back of my hand. How do I find some fucking customers? Like, where are all the people? (laughs) Show me the money. (laughs) And so I, my friend of mine said, well, Kate, nobody knows you even exist. Like nobody knows you're here. Nobody knows what you do or why you do it. So like, you have to tell them, you have to show them. And I was like, oh yeah, okay. I can do that. So address I started in 2014 and it kind of started, that was kind of around the time when pop-up shops were like a thing. And so it sort of started as a pop-up shop. I remember I had to beg, borrow and steal nine exhibitors to show work with me. Nobody wanted to do it because like, who am I? I'm nobody. Right. (laughs) And so I was like, I'm going to do this cool pop-up shop. You guys should join me. And so they did hop on board and 
we did the show. There was nine exhibitors the first year. It was in this teeny tiny little venue <laughs> in the most grungiest neighborhood in Vancouver. It was nobody came. <laughs> <laughs> nobody came to it we actually had a really cool party my friend amber invited all of her designer friends and so there was a great party but then other than that pretty much nobody came <laughs> nobody knew we were there and i remember i went to my friend kevin's house after the first address and i didn't sell anything i didn't i didn't sell one piece of furniture i thought i would sell everything <laughs> i thought i would sell beds and credenzas and i didn't sell anything i didn't even sell cutting board and i was at my friend kevin's house and i i came home after packing up this giant pop-up shop that was we had set up for like two weeks and i had a shower and i was kind of decompressing and i i'm come out of the shower and i'm wrapped in a towel sitting on his couch crying <laughs> going i can't believe this is the end of my story <laughs> And my friend Kevin is just like, oh, God, here we go again. And he just, you know, gave me a little pat on the back. And he's like, Kate, it's totally fine. You did good. It's all great. And so I don't know why I decided to do it again. I really I don't know why I did it a second time, because the first time was so much work. I had no idea what I was doing. I really didn't get any results that I was looking for. But there was a lot of positive feedback from the people that did come and the other exhibitors. The space was really, really beautiful. So I got a lot of feedback about how beautiful the exhibit was. And I, I did. I just did it again because I'm a sucker for punishment. And so I, the next year was kind of the real first year where I rented a really beautiful venue. Arthur Erickson has this beautiful building called the Waterfall Building. It's an architect building. And so I rented the Waterfall Building. I think there was 14 exhibitors the second year. And they actually pitched in like and paid money to help cover the costs of like renting the venue and setting it all up and stuff. So that was really cool. And then the third year was also at the waterfall building. We had 19 exhibitors last year. We had 40 exhibitors. All right. You're picking up steam. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're getting lots of people through the door. Now we're getting like our launch parties are just they're ginormous. I had to like hire staff and bartenders and a DJ. I was like, Thought it was really cool when I hired my first real DJ and not just my buddy like yeah. with his laptop. With a playlist. <laughs> totally. <laughs> but you're coalescing a community together too. A community of independent designer makers who, like you have said, like too big for a craft show and too small for a trade show. Yeah, it's, it's really hard to find a platform where people... That, that people are going to want to come to. And then when they get there, they're going to actually understand what they're seeing. It's not going to kind of get lost in this big mix. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. So when I designed the show, I definitely have had and do still have some like pretty fierce objectives. Like one is to create a space that people want to see people want to come to. So rather than having rows and rows of booth displays, the whole space is staged and curated by an interior designer, Amber Kingsnorth. She comes in and takes all of our work and just lays it out. It's so beautiful, guys. And all of our stuff is kind of mashed in together. So like there'll be like a dining room vignette with a, like maybe a dining table that you know, a woodworker is made and then there'll be plates that a ceramic artist is made and there'll be flatware that like a metalsmith has made. There'll be like a light fixture that's locally made and artwork that's locally made and a rug that's designed by a local rug designer. It's so incredible to see all of this talent kind of mashed into one just stunning vignette. And there, there's like five or six of them. There'll be like quite a few vignettes in the space, depending on how big it is and how many exhibitors are showing. Sounds amazing. I love it. I love it. I always kind of go in going, oh, my God, what is everyone going to bring? Is it going to all go together? I don't know what's happening. And then Amber just like comes in and like waves a magic wand and poof, it's like beautiful. I don't know how she does it. She's kind of incredible that way. And so this is something that you put together every year and it's up for how long? Just a week. Then do you time it with other design events going on in the city? 
Yeah, this year we timed it the same time as IDS, which is the big, big Vancouver design show at the Vancouver Trading Convention Center. We thought that if we kind of teamed up with them, it would maybe help get like out of towners to see the exhibit. Because I know a lot of people come into town for IDS from out of town. So we kind of wanted to capture that audience as well. This is the first year that we kind of aligned with IDS. And like, I'm good at parties and they're good at parties and we're merging our party power on Saturday night. So the big IDS party and the big address party are both joining forces to be one big power party. <laughs> oh, wow. You can see it from space. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I want to talk a little bit about your creative process because you tend toward more traditional woodworking, a lot of clean lines, very sleek Japanese influence and using local hardwoods. Is that right? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Because my kind of roots are in woodwork and those woodworking roots are definitely very much in the arts and crafts movement. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of my aesthetic and approach to building furniture and designing furniture comes from that, like from being a woodworker, not necessarily a designer, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, purposefully launched the purposeful collection in 2016 and i've actually got a new collection on my bench right now it's in production right now and it's a little bit more sculptural so i'm I'm kind of excited to see it really take shape it's more coming from the perspective of a designer i think i mean i didn't go to design school or anything but i definitely have an appreciation for design and aesthetics so rather than just looking at and studying furniture and like the arts and crafts movement and Nakashima and Sam Malouf and all of those, you know, heavy hitters, I started to look at different forms of art, glass, sculpture, ceramics, even lighting. There's some beautiful lighting happening. And the new collection is much more sculptural in its aesthetic. Mm. When I was in high school, my big high school project in grade 12 was a roll top desk. And the top of a roll top desk is these strips of wood that roll. And it's did you make a timbre? Yeah, tambour. Yeah. So the new collection doesn't have any functional tambour, but I use that method to shape the pieces. So it sounds really weird and kind of out there, but I use that concept and that technique to create uh, different shapes. Ah, uh, like curvilinear shapes. Are you connecting with leather or how are you joining? Yeah. Wow. That sounds beautiful. Yeah. It's super fun. And it's fun to like kind of lean into something that's a little bit less technical. Like it's not just dovetails and miter joints and. You know. Yeah. But timbre is pretty technical. I mean, I guess if it's not, doesn't have to slide, it's a little less technical, but yeah. Still. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. It doesn't really slide. It just <laughs> is a function of creating curves and different shapes. So we're, we're having a lot of fun with that. Ooh, I'm intrigued. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. I'm excited. Okay, so let's talk about you like holistically because we've already gotten a sense of the, the contrast between your masculine and feminine sides. As a professional out there in the world, you wear many hats. You're, you're a woodworker. You're also a designer. You've started this brand, which makes you an entrepreneur. You've been a teacher, and I know that you have an apprentice, so you're a mentor. You've organized this platform, yeah. this event. You've hired DJs. You drink. You're a prolific <laughs> beer drinker. <laughs> That's very true. Yes, <laughs> all of the beer, all of the time. But I want to know, like, what's the ratio? These are all different hats that you have to wear. What's the ratio? And like, what hat? Do you only wear when you have to because it's necessary? And what hat never comes off? Oh, such a great question. So many hats. It's hard. It's hard to figure out which one to put on and when. I get really good at making lists and then taking those lists and then prioritizing things like lists on lists. I got to say, I'm not a real big fan of like actually running a business. If I could like delete entrepreneur off Mm -hmm. of my 
desk. I, I would just get rid of the whole desk. I don't need a desk. I need a, a workbench. Wouldn't you just love to be able to hire your own boss, like your own business manager? Totally. Manager. Totally. Oh, that'd be so rad. And then they could tell me what to do and how to prioritize everything. <laughs> oh, that sounds amazing. How do I get one of those? Oh my God, the spreadsheets. Oh my God, all the spreadsheets. <laughs> and I, you know, you think, oh, both your parents are accountants. They'll do all the spreadsheets. No, they don't. <laughs> they don't help me with those. <laughs> Yeah, I think if I could, I could get rid of that part, I probably would. I really just love making and designing. I think the designer hat never comes off. That's the one that's love, laminated to your scalp. I can't even look at almost anything without having a designer lens. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. oh, that chair looks really uncomfortable. Um, or, you know, oh, this restaurant, it's so beautiful. I love how they did this or that or, you know, and I just kind of eat it all up with this sort of designer lens. Sometimes that's a curse though, too, because I have also trained my eye to see the failures, the fractures, or the areas that need improvement. And so sometimes that robs a little bit the beauty of an experience when you're totally. seeing how to improve it. But it's also painful when you turn that lens on yourself. <laughs> it's like, oh, oh, why did I do, do that? Do not look in the mirror with the designer's <laughs> eye. Do not. <laughs> do not <laughs> no i know it's hard right yeah. oh that's real that's real <laughs> oh dear <laughs> because there's always like room for improvement oh, so much <laughs> how to make this better or easier or prettier or whatever like oh yeah and it's relentless it is relentless yeah. isn't it yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> such a hard hat to wear <laughs> have you like you're like a very interesting multifaceted creative fun loving person that's very uniquely you you're you're kate duncan right but <laughs> have you always been like this unapologetically or have you kind of moved more toward who you really are as you're as you've progressed your life. Oh, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am a hundred percent Kate Duncan <laughs> for better or for worse. I think she, she didn't really have to find herself. She was there like loud and proud right from day one. <laughs> I definitely feel like there's like an editing that happens. Like I like to say I'm dialing it in. Like I'm, I'm just <laughs> dialing it in a little bit, you know? just little tweaks here and there to try to, you know, be, I think be understood. I think sometimes I can be quite quirky and quite out there. I'm doing this thing and I'm doing this other thing and then I'm going to do this other thing over here. And, you know, sometimes I think that that gets misunderstood and misinterpreted and that's upsetting. It's upsetting to be misunderstood. So I think it's, I'm continuously trying to dial it in for clarity's sake. Yeah. But it's like the the dialing it in is I like how you you framed it as editing. It's not redesigning. It's not improving even. Mm -mm, no. It's just smoothing out how other people can receive you. Yeah, totally. Totally. Well, speaking yeah. speaking of smoothing out to use a woodworking metaphor, let's talk about sanding. <laughs> in the, the, the existential <laughs> sense, sanding is a process of, you know, abrasion in finer and finer grits to remove the marks of machining, smooth out roughness, soften sharp edges. What's your real life parallel? Like, is there some aspect of your experience that is smoothing you out through repeated friction or abrasion? Oh, God. Every day. Every day. I just, yeah, I love that analogy. And so relevant to so many facets of one's existence, no? Like, yeah, so it helps me because friction and abrasion is, it's painful. <laughs> it helps me to think of it as something that's actually a, a process that's reducing the overall friction in the end, or that is smoothing something out. There's also nothing more luxurious than wood that's been sanded to, you know, higher than 220 grit like totally totally it's 
the most luxurious organic material of all. And it's a very natural process if it happens organically. I mean, that's that's how rocks become smooth. And, and so when I can process the friction and pain of life as though it's something that's actually servicing the greater good, it just makes it so much more bearable, don't you think? Yeah, and we're all in this together, right? Like we're all right. <laughs> sanding the shit out of whatever it is we're sanding together. We're all in a big fucking rock tumbler together. <laughs> and sometimes somebody's banging their teeth on me accidentally. <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> I remember one time a mentor of mine reminded me to like stop and observe what you've done. Like put down the sanding block every now and then and just appreciate what you've done, where you're at. You know, you might not be finished, you might not be at 220 grit, but like there's yeah. also something to be said for just pausing for a minute and you know taking a look at what is there and where did you come from you know woo <laughs> pat on the back right yeah yeah celebrating those those small victories or those incremental steps along the way that's a lesson that was tough for me to learn yeah yeah it is a hard one isn't it i was too focused on the future all the time and also with that designer's lens, like, I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. It can be better. It can be better. It's so hard. Like, the struggle is real. I want to know if you have any big goals, whether it's for your business or for you personally or for something you might want to build. Like, what? what's your biggest goal? I think the goals are kind of there. They're They're laid out. I think it's more the same. I think... More furniture, more address, more community, more dog walks. I don't go on nearly enough dog walks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, more, more of the same. Hey, man, how, how better do you know that you're on the right track if all you want is more of what you're doing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <That's the best. laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's true. I, I, lo I love everything that's, that's kind of... That's happening. What's your dog's name? Cooper. <laughs> He's the best. Did you name him Cooper after a woodworking term? No, I didn't. I named him Cooper oh. so we would have the cutest hashtag ever, Kate and Cooper. Oh, that's pretty cute. Okay. Okay. Do you have a new project or a collection or something you want our listeners to know about that we can direct them to? Yeah. It's coming. It's a coming. She's a good one. Super excited about the new collection. I'm going to drop a few pieces at address in September and then try to wake, make my way to ICFF this year. Um, so hopefully there's something good to show there. Where can we keep tabs on all this on the web and social media? Oh, social media, man. I love it and I hate it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I kind of had to ditch my Facebook and my Twitter those that was too much for me. But Instagram is kind of where I'm feeling it. So I I definitely check out Instagram at Kate Duncan Design or at Address Assembly and the websites too, right? KateDuncan.ca and AddressAssembly.com. Well, thank you Thanks, so Kate. much. No, thank you guys. This has Yay. been a real pleasure. Yay! Yay! Thanks. <laughs> oh my gosh! I knew you guys would hit it off. <laughs> I found my lost best friend. <laughs> <laughs> I've known of her and I've been hearing of her for years and other people have told me that we'd hit it off. So it was actually really, really fun to talk to her. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you guys have a lot in common. I like how she's unadulterated Kate. Like, that hasn't always been easy to be that way. Mm -hmm. But she hasn't conformed in a way that she had to then have some sort of epic life crisis to bust out of mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's really super refreshing and more power to her you know well first of all there's no way in hell i would ever teach a group of 15 year old boys <laughs> especially around like like equipment that might be unsafe like <laughs> i don't know how she handled that but man kudos to her for doing that for 10 years i mean geez yeah, that's not something that appeals to me. Either. <laughs> <laughs> I also really appreciated what she was talking about when she was looking into gender in 
the traits. I think that's a really important topic and there's not enough conversation about it right now. And I think there really should be because like she said, like it's not that girls aren't interested in learning how to do these things. It would be really great to figure out more ways where those things could be presented to girls at an earlier age or have them have more hands-on experience. Cause she said she had her first shop class in seventh grade. Like we didn't have shop. I, I don't even remember, I guess there was shop in high school, but it wasn't even something that was presented to me as an option. I agree with you. I think it's super fascinating all that research that she did. And it brings to mind a couple of things. There's a lot of talk about the gender disparity in the tech industry these days. Mm -hmm. And women have said that it's, it's just a really, unpleasant <laughs> proposition they have to make mm -hmm. in order to enter this like sort of bro sphere and how to navigate that bro sphere. And another thing that I rem am reminded of is when we talked to Norm Abram and he talked about how there's going to be so much opportunity in the trades because we're entering a space in which we've lost a lot of trade labor. And so we need to fill that up and we should be filling it up with a more equal proportion of men and women mm -hmm. because, well, there's a lot of good things that come from diversity right. of thought, diversity of ability, and and also if we can somehow make it a proposition where women don't have to not be women anymore in order to do it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Like, why do you have to f have just one persona or just stick with their your masculine essence and you can't embrace your femininity that doesn't make any sense to me at all and there are so many ways that really really subtle ways that women just get funneled away it's not even like they're told they can't do it or they're not welcome here it's like they just get subtly encouraged to do something else somewhere earlier down the line mm -hmm. and so I just feel like that's not good for society. That's not good for the economy. That's not good for healthy, well-rounded people. <laughs> yeah. I was treated as such a novel idea when I was a Finnish carpenter. You know, I was a contractor. Mm -hmm. I would drive around with tools in my van and go fix shit for people or make stuff for people. and. I, I couldn't believe what a novelty I was. I mean, I could believe it, but I just don't think it needs to be a novelty. It's a very real skill that anybody can possess if they want to. It's super annoying too, to feel like you're a novelty because it feels like you have to be a spokesperson for like the whole gender of women who are right. in woodworking. Like, yeah, right. how, can you, how, how can you represent this whole class of people? And you're like, I'm just trying to do my job. Yeah, I'm just doing my thing the way I do my thing, right. okay? <laughs> well, anyway, Kate Duncan, um, her story about being in the accident was incredible. Well, first of all, thank goodness she survived that accident and yes. was able to continue doing work after that. My gosh. But um, I think it, it was a beautiful story of being able to rehab in a therapeutic way physically, but by actually creating and using her talents and um, doing it the way that she wanted to do it. So this was like an unfortunate yet fortunate way for her to transition into doing mm -hmm. something completely different. And it sounds like she really loves what she does, not only with her own brand, Kate Duncan, but with address and building this whole incredible design community that she's built in such a short time in Vancouver. I know. That enthusiasm is powerful, too. She's a force. I love it. I do want to mention that if you had a band with Kate, it would be called Sawdust Cleavage, and your first album would be called All of the Pockets. Oh! <laughs> Yeah, those are the things I take notes about when we're having our conversation Sawdust with guests. Thanks for listening. Please go to cleverpodcast.com to sign up for our newsletter, read the show notes and see images of Kate's work. You can also find us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Plus, please do us a favor and subscribe, rate and review. It's one of the easiest ways you can help us keep on making the show and get new listeners. 
We're on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Clever Podcast. We absolutely love hearing your thoughts and feedback, so connect with us on social and be our friend. Clever is produced by us, Amy and Jamie, also known as 2VDE Media, and was edited by Alex Perez and Ty Navaris, with music by L1011. 